welcome everyone. Um, welcome to our grand rounds with Dr. <clears throat> Ranjul Gupta. She's a hematologist and medical oncologist joining us today from Lehigh Valley Health Network in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Um, today, she will be talking about breast cancer. My name is Anne Catherine Gertler, and I am a second year medical student at Wayne State School of Medicine in Detroit. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the Q&A and we will have time at the end where we will address them. Go ahead, Dr. Gupta. Thank you so much uh, for giving me an opportunity. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to all my colleagues who are joining me from wherever they are in the world. I am going to try my best to present an update in the treatment of breast cancer 2021. I have a lot of slides. So pardon me if I'm only touching some points, I can answer some questions at the end. I hope to be able to do this in about 45, 50 minutes, so bear with me. Uh, all right, uh, conflict of interest. I have, uh, I'm a speaker for Eli Lilly, but there will be nothing I will be talking about here in the, uh, in the talk today that will be a conflict. So we'll start talking a little bit about uh, the epidemiology. Uh, it is uh, not surprising that female breast cancer now has surpassed uh, lung cancer as the most diagnosed cancer with an estimated of 2.3 million new cases in 2020. In fact, it is the fifth most common cause, uh, uh, common cancer related, um, uh, breast cancer is the fifth most uh, common cancer uh, uh, as a cause of mortality worldwide. It is the leading cause of cancer death in females in 110 uh, countries and second to cervical cancer in 36 other uh, countries. Even though the incidence rate is 88% higher in transition, which is basically developed countries at 55.9 per 100,000 population, uh, compared to 29.7 in the developing countries, the mortality, unfortunately, is higher in the developing countries at 15 per 100,000 population versus 12.8 in the developed countries. The highest incidence is in Belgium, and the highest mortality is in Bar Barbados, uh, Melanesia, and West Africa. As far as the diagnosis is concerned, I just have one slide. According to the American uh, Cancer Society here in the United States, we start mammogram at the age of 45. In fact, we start the mammogram annually at the age of 40 years. The recommendation is 45 years. ESMO guidelines for Europe, uh, they recommend screening mammograms at the age of 50 to 69 years of age and every two to three years compared to every year in the United States. Is if the lesion is uh, suspected, ultrasound is recommended to confirm the size and assess the lymph node status. MRI uh, of the breast is recommended only in very high risk uh, uh, conditions like uh, presence of uh, germline uh, uh, BRCA mutations or very, very dense breast and strong family history. In countries where there is no routine screening mammographies, most breast cancer is diagnosed as palpable masses. Biopsy or FNA is recommended if the lesion is uh, suspected. I see mostly FNA is being done in um, uh, developing countries. Um, you know, I get a lot of uh, consults um, from India every, every um, uh, month, and I see FNA is being um, uh, most commonly done. Generally, a clip is placed at the uh, site of the lesion at the time of the biopsy. One of the reasons I am putting this in the slide form is that in most uh, developing countries compared to uh, developed countries, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2 is not done as a reflex uh, test on the FNA. Most of these uh, is because in these countries, once they have established that a patient has early breast cancer, they go directly for surgery, and the ERPR and HER2 is done on the final specimen. This, I think, needs to be changed. Since uh, we do uh, use a neoadjuvant treatment in uh, HER2 positive and uh, triple negative breast cancer uh, in high risk conditions like uh, stage two and stage three, and that opportunity will be missed if we do not do ERPR and HER2. 
So I implore um, all the uh, all my colleagues who are joining me from worldwide, where uh, this is not being done, that ERPR and HER2 has to be done uh, at the time of diagnosis. That's the standard of care um, in United States uh, and also most European countries. General principles have not changed. We all know that as far as local reference is concerned, um, mastectomy is almost equal to lumpectomy and radiation. Uh, margins should be negative for both invasive and non-invasive non cancers. We are really now not in, uh, um, um, talking about five millimeters versus one millimeter um, uh, margins. As far as the margins are negative for both invasive and non-invasive cancers, that is okay. If we have invasive cancers, sentinel lymph node needs to be done. This is still lacking up to us um, somewhat in developing countries. Uh, the big change has been that if no lymph node was uh, clinically diagnosed, that means it was not palpable or seen on the ultrasound, axillary node dissection does not need to be done if sentinel lymph node is positive. Sentinel lymph node is not indicated in non-invasive cancers. Radiation is a must after um, breast conservation surgery or lumpectomy and post mastectomy uh, radiation is indicated if uh, positive margins are present, tumor size is more than five centimeters and more than uh, three lymph nodes are positive. We are going to switch gears and we are going to talk about early breast cancer. I'm only going to talk about um, the most important changes that have been uh, present. So, um, this is a, a, a slide which is showing the various prognostic uh, uh, factors which are really, really important in a hormone receptor positive breast cancer, nodal stage, uh, status, tumor stage, grade, and KI67, more than 20% or less than um, 15%. And you can see the uh, relative risk um, of recurrence uh, based upon these prognostic features. This is a slide which is just showing that even in patients who have lymph node negative uh, T1 disease, at 20 uh, years, uh, they have a 15% uh, risk of recurrence. And that goes up um, as we go on either the tumor size, T2 has 20%, or the lymph node status, four to nine uh, lymph nodes, 40% of the patients will have uh, reference despite the standard of care treatment. And the risk is almost 50% in patients who have T2 and 2 disease. So very important to recognize this so that we are not talking about not treating patients with a very small early stage disease because the risk of recurrence is substantial in these patients. The systemic treatment for breast cancer is divided into various categories, hormone receptor positive or to new negative, triple negative and HER2 positive disease. So when I'm going to be talking about uh, treatment in early stage and metastatic breast cancer, I will be uh, dividing my talk uh, based upon these three categories. This is the NCCN guidelines talking about the treatment of hormone receptor positive, HER2 new negative breast cancer. This is what we follow in United States. Patients who have tumor less than 0.5 centimeters lymph node negative, whether they are ductal, lobular, or mixed um, um, histology, should be considered for endocrine treatment. Patients who have disease more than 0.5 uh, centimeters, we are um, uh, routinely doing oncotype reference score, which is a 21 gene um, RT-PCR assay. And then based upon um, the scores, we are either giving endocrine therapy alone or patients who have disease uh, recurrence score more than 26 um, are strongly recommended to have um, chemotherapy and that is the standard of care. I will be showing some slides based upon that. And patients who have um, more than four uh, lymph nodes or um, with a metastasis of more than two millimeters, chemotherapy is strongly recommended. So uh, what, is there a need for chemotherapy in patients with a lymph node negative, hormone receptor positive, or to negative breast cancer? This uh, question was answered in, uh, prospectively by the Taylor X trial. 
which uh, included more than 11,000 patients. All patients had oncotype reference score done. And then the analysis was based upon uh, group one, which was reference score less than 11. All of these patients got just endocrine therapy. Patients who had a recurrence score of uh, more than 25, these patients received chemotherapy and endocrine therapy. And the main um, study group was the recurrence score of uh, 11 to 25, and patients were randomized to hormone therapy alone versus chemotherapy and hormonal therapy. So this is just one slide showing the IDFS, uh, the freedom from recurrence from breast cancer at distant sites and freedom for recurrence at any site in patients who had recurrence score less than 11, 10 or less. And as you can see, these patients have very favorable uh, prognosis. And at um, um, five years, um, the IDFS, the freedom from recurrence at distant site and freedom for recurrence at any site was upwards of 90%. Uh, and grade was the only significant predictor of reference. So these patients will do very well on endocrine therapy alone and have very, very favorable prognosis. This is the main um, uh, group that we are talking about, the clinical outcomes in the intent to treat population in patients who had a reference score between 11 to 25. And in the intent to treat population, there was no difference uh, in the IDFS, which was the primary endpoint in the um, a population between chemotherapy versus um, chemotherapy and endocrine therapy alone. So endocrine therapy is alone is in the um, um, uh, broken um, um, graph and the solid line is the chemo and endocrine and you can see no difference in the IDFS or freedom from recurrence at a distant site. However, if we break this down uh, based upon the recurrence score, and this is again in the intent to treat population rate at five years and rate at nine years. And you can see the IDFS uh, in the um, score of less than 10, 94%, 93%, 11 to 25 in the endocrine therapy, um, uh, endocrine therapy uh, alone arm, and 11 to 25 chemo and endocrine therapy, 93%. Again, no difference in uh, IDFS. Similarly, no difference in the recurrence uh, of breast cancer at distant site in uh, scores between 11 to 25 in the endocrine arm, 98% and 98.2%. So uh, same thing that I showed in the first graph is what I'm showing over here. This is uh, the kaplan meyer estimates. What was very interesting in this trial is the subset of patients who are 50 years of age or younger Majority of these patients were uh, premenopausal. And if we again pay attention to the IDFS, um, and you look at this uh, scores between 16 to 20 in the endocrine uh, therapy arm, uh, which was about 92%, and scores of 16 to 20 with chemotherapy and endocrine arm, and you can see the IDFS at five years was almost about 95%, a difference between um, the two arms of about um, uh, 2.7%. And in the 21 to 25 um, um, score, the difference was almost about 6%. So you can see a significant, significant difference um, uh, between the chemoendocrine uh, versus endocrine arm in patients who are less than 50 years of age. And the same thing you will see freedom from recurrence of breast cancer at a distant site. There is a difference in the uh, subgroups of 16 to 20 and 21 to 25 in this population of 50 years of age and younger with a delta of about 1.6% in the uh, 16 to 20 and a delta of about 6% uh, in um, uh, 21 to 25. Dr. Sperano, who was the uh, uh, main author for uh, uh, the Taylor X trial, actually uh, did a subgroup analysis uh, in a subsequent uh, publication that was published in uh, 2019. And they uh, showed uh, very eloquently that the main benefit in these population was because of ovarian suppression from chemotherapy, specifically in the 16 to 20 um, uh, score. 
Uh, what does this mean? Uh, this means that in patients who are um, less than 50 years of age group or who are premenopausal predominantly should be offered uh, chemotherapy for the uh, oncotype recurrence score of uh, 20 to 25. Uh, that is basically we, uh, what we do. And in scores between 16 to 20 in my uh, practice, I will have a very uh, long discussion with the patient and family members about the benefit for chemotherapy versus ovarian suppression. So 16 to 20, I will do ovarian suppression versus chemotherapy. Less than um, uh, 16, um, uh, just endocrine therapy alone. And uh, more than 21, I will offer these patients chemotherapy. Uh, switching gears as to the choice of uh, endocrine therapy, you know in premenopausal uh, patients, tamoxifen uh, can be given as a loan um, uh, or in uh, combination with ovarian suppression, aromatase inhibitors has, has to be given with either ovarian suppression or ovarian ablation. And in postmenopausal uh, women, we can give tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors. So that is one part of the problem. The second problem is the um, um, uh, the uh, duration of endocrine therapy. So I will be uh, spending a few minutes talking about the choice of endocrine therapy, switch from tamoxifen to aromatase inhibitors, and the duration of endocrine therapy. So let's start as to uh, aromatase inhibitors versus tamoxifen. This is uh, the slide showing various um, uh, trials with upfront uh, and uh, aromatase inhibitor versus tamoxifen, the early switch from uh, tamoxifen versus aromatase inhibitors, and the sequencing of giving tamoxifen for five years, uh, followed by uh, aromatase inhibitors in the switch technique. The, um, uh, the uh, DFS uh, benefit can be seen, as you can see, in the hazard ratio. And there's some trials will show some overall survival benefit. The bottom line is that there is an absolute uh, disease-free survival reduction at three to six years. With the upfront uh, tamoxifen versus AI, about two to four percent early switch, like was seen in the IES study or the um, uh, ITA studies. Uh, the benefit is about three to five percent um, um, for uh, aromatase inhibitors uh, versus tamoxifen, and this E sequence from tamoxifen to AI about 1.5%. Then the choice between uh, aromatase inhibitors, you know we have three uh, aromatase inhibitors, anastrozole, uh, letrozole, which are both the non-steroidal aromatase inhibitors, and then the exemestin, which is the uh, steroidal aromatase inhibitors. This is just one of the studies showing um, the difference between letrozole and astrozole. You cannot see any difference between them. Bottom line, there is no difference between all the three aromatase inhibitors. So dealer's choice that you can choose one over the other. I did want to point out uh, from a subgroup analysis of lobular cancer in the big 198 trial, if there was any benefit of one endocrine therapy versus the other. So this is a subset analysis. And you can see based upon the ductal versus the lobular that um, uh, uh, letrozole is favored over tamoxifen. But if you look at the... Um, uh, hazard ratios uh, in the lobular um, uh, subset, the hazard ratio is 0 0.38, uh, favoring letrozole compared to a hazard ratio of 0 0.72 in the ductal um, uh, histology. Again, bottom line, that in patients with lobular histology, um, aromatase inhibitors, the non-steroidal aromatase inhibitors would be favored over tamoxifen if possible. What did we learn? Aromatase inhibitors are slightly uh, uh, better than tamoxifen in the overall population. Switch from tamoxifen to aromatase inhibitor at any point is better than tamoxifen. And tamoxifen of, uh, for five years followed by aromatase inhibitor for five years is better than tamoxifen for five years. Think two to 4% benefit in all of these. And there was no significant, significant overall survival benefit of aromatase inhibitors uh, compared to tamoxifen in all of these trials. We are going to talk, uh, spend a few minutes, I'm going to digress and talk about endocrine therapy in premenopausal women, a role of ovarian suppression, because this is one of the most uh, common questions that I have been asked um, um, uh, by various colleagues of mine. 
So this is based upon the joint analysis from the text and the soft trial. Um, and the text trial, in both these trials, uh, we actually had patients on tamoxifen and ovarian suppression for five years versus exemestane and ovarian suppression for five years. In the soft trial, there was a comparator of tamoxifen for five years also. In the joint analysis, we had about 4,600 patients, median follow of about 5.7%. Very busy slide. Please pay attention to the overall um, um, survival benefit in the intent to treat a, a population. And as you can see, there is no gap uh, in the patients with randomized to tamoxifen and ovarian suppression versus exemestane and ovarian suppression in the intent to treat population. Compare that to the uh, panel in uh, D, and you can see the overall survival in patients with previous chemotherapy. Uh, these are the high-risk patients, and you can see that there is a benefit of patients uh, getting tamoxifen or exemestane with ovarian suppression compared to uh, patients who got tamoxifen alone. So the blue and the red graphs on the top are the patients who got ovarian suppression, and the, um, uh, the graph with the uh, black line is the patients who only got tamoxifen, and you can see the ovarian suppression has benefit on uh, compared to tamoxifen alone. Disease-free survival uh, benefit, absolute benefit of about 4% 4, 4 of exemestin over tamoxifen uh, and ovarian suppression. Freedom from breast cancer, again, an absolute dif difference of about 4% in patients who got exemestin and ovarian suppression compared to tamoxifen and ovarian suppression, no uh, benefit of, over, of overall survival uh, from exemestin uh, versus tamoxifen and ovarian suppression. Um, so what is the ASCO guidelines uh, regarding adjuvant ovarian suppression in early breast cancer? High-risk patients who have chemotherapy should receive ovarian suppression Patient with stage one breast cancer that do not warrant chemotherapy should not receive ovarian suppression. Tamoxifen or AI is acceptable with ovarian suppression. We did not see any overall survival benefit of tamox, the one or the other. And five years of ovarian suppression is recommended. Again, aromatase inhibitors will be recommended over tamoxifen along with ovarian suppression in high-risk women. Younger patients, Lymph node positive uh, patients, large tumor volume. These are the patients where you should try to uh, give aromatase inhibitors uh, with ovarian suppression compared to tamoxifen with ovarian suppression. Um, next, I, I said I will be talking about extended endocrine therapy um, over five years. And these are the various trials that have been done, MA17, 17R, ATEM, ATLAS, the NSABPB33, the ABCSG uh, 6A trials, and the absolute benefit of more than five years of adjuvant endocrine therapy is somewhere between two to 5%. Hazard ratios are staying between 0.58 to 0.85, um, as you can see in various trials. What are the ASCO guidelines? Uh, do not off, uh, we should not routinely offer extended aromatase inhibitor more than five years in patients with node negative uh, breast cancers. We should offer extended aromatase inhibitor to women with lymph node positive breast cancers. We should not be at this time giving more than 10 years of adjuvant uh, endocrine therapy to any patients. And these are the various references that you can see. We have to understand that one of the major benefits of giving extended aromatase inhibitor is as a chemo prevention in prevention of a contralateral breast cancer or ipsilateral second breast cancer. And that risk and benefit has to be weighed in with each patient. And a shared decision making with a patient is critical in these um, scenarios. So what is new and upcoming uh, in uh, early stage hormone receptor breast cancer? The first is the role of CDK4-6 inhibitors in adjuvant breast cancers. We all know that CDK4-6 inhibitors are now the standard of care in first line setting uh, metastatic hormone receptor positive or to new negative breast cancer. But in the last year, we have had a lot of presentations talking about um, the role of CDK4-6 inhibitors in early stage, high-risk 
hormone receptor positive for new breast cancer. I'm going to present two of these studies just because of um, the interest of time. The first study that was presented in es ESMO 2020 was the PALACE study, which was a fa um, phase three open label study of palbociclib uh, and adjuvant endocrine therapy. Patients who had stage two and three hormone receptor positive or two, uh, um, negative breast cancers after completion of um, standard treatment with surgery, chemotherapy, plus minus radiation, within 12 months of diagnosis were randomized to either endocrine therapy alone, which is a standard of care, versus the experimental arm of giving palbociclib for two years in addition to endocrine therapy. Primary endpoint in all of these trials would be IDFS. And as you can see, this was a negative study. There was no, absolutely no benefit as far as IDFS or distant relapse re uh, survival is concerned in uh, the arm containing palbociclib plus endocrine therapy versus endocrine therapy alone, 88% versus 88.5%. As far as the IDFS is concerned, and the DF DRFS was also 89.3% in the palbociclib arm versus 97% in the endocrine therapy arm. Uh, um, this was at a median follow-up of 23.7 um, months and there was no um, uh, benefit at all. So not only the PALACE study, uh, there was a second study that was presented at the um, ASCO 2020, the Penelope uh, trial, and that was also a negative study. So we have had two trials for palbociclib, which are completely negative study in early stage high risk um, um, uh, uh, hormone receptor positive or to negative breast cancer. What about the abema cyclip, which is the second um, 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 CDK46 inhibitors in the uh, studied in the Monarch E, E stands for early uh, trial. Please notice the inclusion trial. These are very high risk patients. So in the uh, inclusion criteria, we had either patients who had N2 disease, four or more positive axillary lymph node, or one to three positive lymph nodes with at least one of the below, tumor size more than five centimeter, histologic grade three, or KI67 more than 20%. And these patients were given a BMI cyclic, 150 milligrams BID for up to two years, along with standard of uh, care endocrine therapy versus endocrine therapy alone. Primary uh, objective was again IDFS. And you can see that at two year uh, disease relapse, distant release, distant relapse free survival rate were 93.6% in the abema cyclic arm compared to 90.3%, uh, which was statistically significant at a p-value of 0.085 and a hazard ratio of 0.71. Uh, with a risk of distant recurrence a reduction of 28.3%. These were uh, what were presented at the ESMO 2020 with a median of 15.5 month follow-up. Only 12.5% of the patients had com uh, completed uh, two years. So very, very early data presentation. No new toxicities were uh, seen. Though we do know that abema cyclic was more toxic, there was increased risk of ILD and VTE, uh, along with what we already know like diarrhea. There was significantly improved IDFS and a DRFS of a, a, a 3.5% absolute benefit in the IDFS and 3.3% absolute benefit in the DRFS with a hazard ratio somewhere between um, 0.74 and 7.1. Uh, as you can see, there was no subgroup specific treatment uh, effect uh, demonstrated. Trial is immature for overall survival. So two uh, CDK46 inhibitor, one complete negative, one show, um, uh, show one complete negative on with the PALACE study, and one showing uh, um, significant benefit in the IDFS and DRFS but very, very early data point uh, setting at 15.5 uh, month follow-up. So more to see. The third CDK46 inhibitor is the ribociclib and is being currently uh, studied in the NATLI uh, trial. The trial has completed accrual 
uh, and we are eagerly awaiting um, uh, to see uh, what that will show. Uh, in the NATLI trial, uh, the ribociclib is being given for three years. So more to come. The second uh, significant uh, development has been the Olympia study. This was actually just uh, approved uh, in the last month or so. Um, so these are the patients. This is a randomized double-blind international phase three uh, trial with a data cutoff at uh, March 2020. These are patients uh, with high-risk germline, BRCA mutation uh, positive, uh, HER2 new negative breast cancers. Two subgroups, triple negative subgroup was there. In these, the uh, inclusion criteria was patients who had prior neoadjuvant uh, uh, treatment uh, and did not achieve PCR at the time of surgery or those who went for surgery had to have high risk uh, disease defined as more than um, uh, pathological lymph node positive or T2 or higher uh, disease. In the patients who had hormone receptor positive or to new negative subgroup, these were patients who uh, had prior new adjuvant treatment and no PCR at the time of surgery and a CPS EG score of more than three, or those patients who went for surgery directly had to have lymph node uh, positive disease in more than four lymph nodes. So very, very high risk disease patients and these patients were randomized to olaparib at standard doses for one year versus placebo. Primary endpoint was again IDFS. And you can see a significant improvement uh, in the three-year IDFS of, um, uh, 70, from 77.1% in the placebo group to 85.9% in the olaparib uh, group with a hazard ratio of 0 0.458 uh, with a 41% uh, risk reduction uh, and a p-value which was statistically significant. So based upon this, olaparib is now approved in the United States. Uh, to be given uh, to uh, these very high risk uh, patients. Um, I actually changed, this is not FDA approved, but has been recommended uh, by the uh, NCC and the, and the uh, ASCO guidelines. Switching gears to her to a positive uh, early breast cancer, and there will be, we will be talking about escalation of treatment and de-escalation of treatment in certain subsets. Let's start with escalation of treatments would be in the high-risk patients, those who will need preoperative or neoadjuvant chemotherapy. These will be patients who have T2 or higher disease or lymph node positive breast cancers. And all of these patients should be um, uh, um, offered a neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Or the third group that should be offered neoadjuvants are those patients who have uh, a need to shrink their cancer for optimal surgery. In this population, uh, pertuzumab is indicated. Addition of pertuzumab increased the pathological complete response. And there was a small significant overall survival only in patients who had lymph node positive disease. In the United state, States right now, um, uh, the standard of care would be to give um, uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy with Herceptin, uh, with restuzumab and pertuzumab in patients who have T2 or higher or lymph node positive, uh, or to positive uh, uh, breast cancer. The choice of chemotherapy can be adriamycin-based uh, chemotherapy like the ACTHP or non-anthracycline based, which will be the TS, uh, TCHP um, uh, based upon um, uh, the various trials. The other part is the Catherine study, which really uh, was a major uh, change in our uh, approach to hormone receptor, uh, uh, the how to positive breast cancers. And this is based upon the Catherine study. These patients uh, were patients who had uh, either uh, T1C or higher or lymph node positive breast cancer. These patients were given a neoadjuvant chemotherapy and underwent standard of care surgery. And based upon uh, if they had a uh, residual disease, either in the tumor bed or in the lymph nodes, patients were randomized to TDM1 for 14 cycles or restuzumab for 14 cycles. By the time uh, this study 
um, was designed. Um, uh, trastuzumab alone was a standard of care in the adjuvant setting by the time the study was presented. However, we had started using pertuzumab in neoadjuvant and adjuvant setting in uh, this patient population. So that caveat is there. And what we see here is a significant improvement in the three-year IDFS uh, from 77% in the uh, trastuzumab arm to 88.3% in the patients who um, were switched to TDM1 uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.5%. Um, uh, and this was statistically significant. And all events, whether we are talking about distant recurrence, local regional recurrence, contralateral breast cancer, or death without a prior event was significantly improved uh, in the TDM1 arm compared to trastuzumab. And at the current time, this is the standard of care that patients who have at least T2 uh, and higher or lymph node positive or to positive breast cancer, the, uh, all of these patients receive neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy um, um, with um, uh, trastuzumab and pertuzumab. And if they have any amount of residual disease, then we will offer them TDM1 in the um, uh, adjuvant setting. I did tell you that we will be talking about de-escalation of treatment. And the first de-escalation is the role of anthracyclines. I know I mentioned in my previous slides that uh, adriamycin-based chemotherapy is still one of the standard of treatment, but uh, I will show you in, the, in, in this slide that the BCIRG 10.3 uh, uh, years follow-up, which was the only um, uh, trial which had a non-anthracycline arm of TCH, which had about 1,000 patients, and had the arm of ACTH. Uh, these are the only two populations that we are studying. We can see that the overall um, survival was 85% in the anthracycline group versus 83.3% in the non-anthracycline group with no significant difference in the DFS of 69.6% uh, versus 68.4%. And if this was not alone to say that anthracycline was not needed in the majority of these patients in the era of um, targeted therapies, TRAIN2 trials was presented in uh, ASCO of 2020. These, um, in this trial, patients with lymph node positive disease was also uh, included and you can see no difference in the event-free survival in the anthracycline versus non-anthracycline. Um, and based upon these two trials um, and long-term outcomes, um, uh, even in high-risk uh, lymph node positive patients, uh, taxane-based chemotherapies have shown to be as efficacious as anthracycline-based therapies. Obviously, uh, there is a significantly less cardiac toxicity in the non-anthracycline arms, numerically less leukemia, and therefore it is very hard to justify the use of anthracyclines in the era of uh, her to directed therapies. So in my practice, I rarely use anthracycline um, in, um, even in patients with high-risk disease like lymph node positive or uh, larger size uh, tumors. The second uh, study is the APT trial. And this is nothing new that was uh, uh, that I'm presenting, but I do want to highlight uh, this uh, was a, a phase two trial of about 400 patients uh, done at Dana Farber. There was no randomization. These were patients who had HER2 positive, either ER positive or ER negative. Patients had lymph node negative and less than three centimeters. Majority of the patients had less than two centimeters uh, or T1 disease. And all of the patients were randomized to 12 um, doses of weekly paclitaxel and trastuzumab, followed by trastuzumab for a total of one year. And at a um, um, follow-up of seven years, you can see excellent disease-free survival of 93.3% uh, uh, and recurrence-free interval at seven years of 97.5%. Um, of so again, showing that patients who have a small amount of disease, um, lymph node negative, a T1 disease, it is very um, uh, optimal to just give them Taxol and Herceptin. What I'm not presenting is the ATTEMPT trial, which compared um, Taxol and Herceptin in this uh, manner to TDM1 and showed that both of these uh, studies were equivalent. 
Uh, TDM1 was done as an, a non-inferiority uh, trial, and that was a negative trial, uh, meaning that TDM1 was just uh, equally efficacious to TH, but there was no uh, significant improvement in the quality of life with TDM1. So how do, what is my current approach? Uh, T, uh, T, uh, T1, uh, disease less than two centimeters, clinically lymph node, uh, optimal to do surgery. And then if they have stage one disease, you can either all, or offer them Taxol and Herceptin based upon the APT trial or TDM1 based upon the attempt trial. And in patients who have stage two or stage three, we would give them um, uh, TCH or ACTH. And uh, in United States, we will also give them pertuzumab if they have lymph node positive disease. In patients who have um, 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 disease more than two centimeters or clim clinically lymph node, we will offer them a preoperative or new adjuvant chemotherapy with TCHP or ACTHP. And if they have a complete pathological response rate, um, then we will follow them for a year of Herceptin and of, of uh, Cristuzumab and Pertuzumab. And if they have a residual disease, then those patients will complete a one year of treatment with TDM1. Early stage triple negative breast cancer, nothing more. Again, we will offer these patients um, preoperative or neoadjuvant chemotherapy if they have T2 or higher disease or they have lymph node positive disease. Standard of care till July of 2021 was anthracycline-based chemotherapy in United States. We give dose-dense adriamycin and cytoxin followed by taxin. In other countries like uh, Europe, FEC uh, followed by taxane uh, is a standard of care and both of these are optimal. But what has changed in July of 2021 is the role of immunotherapy in early stage of breast cancer. And these are various trials which have shown improve, significant improvement in the pathological response rate when um, uh, immunotherapy was uh, added. Uh, I am only going to be talking about the Keynote 5222 uh, 5 uh, based upon this trial, a uh, pertuzumab is now uh, approved in high risk early stage uh, triple negative breast cancer. This was a trial uh, which compared standard of uh, care. Uh, patients were T2 uh, to T4 or lymph node uh, um, positive uh, disease, uh, and patients were randomized to standard, which was the carboplatin and taxol, followed by adriamycin or epirubicin plus cyclophosphamide. Um, or, or um, the same chemotherapy arm uh, along with pembrolizumab in the neoadjuvants uh, uh, setting followed by surgery. And then these patients uh, were followed with uh, adjuvant uh, per, uh, pembrolizumab uh, for one year uh, versus placebo. And what we saw, uh, saw was the primary endpoint was um, a pathological complete response, which improved from 51.2% in the um, um, standard arm to 64.8% uh, in the pembrolizumab arm with a delta of 13.6. And this was irrespective of uh, whether patients were PDL1 uh, negative or PDL1 positive. And based upon this data set and the safety. Um, um, uh, signal, um, pembrolizumab is now approved in very high risk patients uh, with triple negative breast cancer in early stage. Uh, we are still uh, finding our way out as to which patient population we use it uh, since there are significant um, permanent uh, immunotoxicity that can be seen from immunotherapy. I think we all agree that patients who have um, high tumor burden, whether it is uh, a disease more than five centimeters or uh, lymph nodes more than four, uh, that we will be offering um, the pembrolizumab in the neoadjuvant and adjuvant setting. But those patients who are just um, one to three positive lymph nodes or uh, two to five centimeters, we are still uh, struggling to figure out which uh, patients we should be um, um, using the pembrolizumab. Uh, create X. This is the last uh, slide in the uh, early stage breast, breast cancer with capecitabine um, in the residual disease. And you can see that capecitabine improves uh, disease-free survival in patients who 
got uh, who had um, residual disease after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and the hazard ratio was uh, better in the patients who were triple negative compared to hormone receptor positive. So this is our standard of care. Those patients um, who had residual disease after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we offer capecitabine. Still struggling to figure out how to combine pembrolizumab in the same setting and uh, capecitabine in the same setting. So more to come. Switching gear to um, metastatic breast cancer, um, we will be talking about hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative. We will be talking about CDK4-6, alpelicid, and Avrolimus. Uh, these are the studies of uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors, palbociclib, ribociclib, abemacyclib in first line and set second line setting with uh, aromatase inhibitor, you can see a significant improvement in the progression-free survival, almost with a hazard ratio of 0 0.5, uh, almost doubling of the PFS from uh, uh, almost 10 to 13 months in various studies to about 20 to 24 months uh, in the CDK4 um, arms. And significant, same way in the second line set, setting in combination with fulvistrant, significant improvement in the PFS with a hazard ratio again of 0 0.5, um, establishing the standard of care in the first line setting of AD, uh, aromatase inhibitors along with any CDK4-6 inhibitors. There is survival benefit um, with um, ribociclib and abemacyclib with a uh, trend towards over overall survival with palbociclib, but not statistically uh, significant. Uh, this is uh, showing that in all subset, whether we are talking about PR negative, lobular cancer, bone only metastasis, de novo metastasis, or a disease re, uh, free survival of more than 12 months, there is a significant improvement in the uh, uh, um, patients receiving CDK4-6 inhibitor, establishing this as a standard of care. Safety wise, CDK4-6 uh, inhibitors are overall very safe, uh, more neutropenia. Uh, with uh, ribociclib and palbociclib compared to abemacyclib, though very few incidences of neutropenic fever, prolongation of QTC intervals uh, with ribociclib, more diarrhea with abemacyclib, and some class effects of ILD in about 2 to 4% with all of these CDK4-6 inhibitors, VTE of about 3 to 5% with all of these CDK4-6 inhibitors, manageable toxicity. SOLAR-1 is um, uh, the trial, again, uh, showing um, uh, the role of abemacyclib in combination with fulvistrant in second line setting after they have failed aromatase inhibitors. Um, we are only going to talk about the PIK3 mutant uh, uh, cohort since that is where we had the um, significant data. Patients were randomized to alpilisib uh, once, once daily in combination with fulvistrant versus uh, placebo and fulvistrant. And you can see significant improvement in the progression-free survival in the alpilisib uh, arm. Uh, in the PIK3 mutated uh, cohort, no uh, benefit in the PIK3 non-mutated uh, cancers. And these are uh, a benefit was maintained in patients uh, receiving prior CDK4-6 inhibitor and uh, also no CDK4-6 inhibitors, establishing uh, and this is FDA approved now in the second line setting in patients who have PIK3 um, um, mutations. It's a, not an easy drug to manage. Hyperglycemia is the overwhelming uh, toxicity um, in almost 85% uh, of the patients. Um, this is the um, um, role of the Everolimus in combination with Examestane, and you can see significant improvement in the progression-free survival with Everolimus plus Examestane in patients who had previously uh, failed AI with trend towards overall survival, but not statistically uh, significant. So this is what we use in uh, right now in all patients with metastatic hormone receptor positive or to new negative. We use CDK4-6 inhibitors um, along with aromatase inhibitors. If they are premenopausal, ovarian suppression or ovarian ablation has to be done. Um, Fulvestrant. Um, uh, along with CDK4-6 inhibitors, if they had previously received uh, tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors. And in the second line settings, again, based upon what they received, uh, they can uh, receive the PIK3. Uh, mutant uh, patients will receive alpelicid, uh, or you can give the Everolimus along with aromatase inhibitors, 
um, monotherapy with CDK4-6 inhibitors can be used or chemotherapy will be used. In hormone uh, HER2 positive breast cancer uh, metastatic, First line setting is the Cleopatra uh, trial, which uh, randomized patients in first line setting to docetaxel along with trastuzumab and pertuzumab versus uh, trastuzumab and docetaxel alone. And this is the first uh, study at a follow up of 15 months, showed significant improvement in the uh, overall survival for 40.8 months in the uh, trastuzumab alone arm to 56.5 months in the trastuzumab and pertuzumab arm with a delta of 15.7 months. This is never seen before and established uh, trastuzumab along with pertuzumab and a taxane as the first line um, therapy um, for harm or how to positive breast cancer. Um, this is a study which I think is very important to know, significant improvement um, in combination of aromatase inhibitor along with pertuzumab and trastuzumab uh, versus trastuzumab and ar uh, um, aromatase inhibitor with a significant improvement in the progression-free survival with a hazard ratio of 0 0.65 with a p-value which was statistically significant. So what we do here is that we will start a patient with the taxin and trastuzumab and pertuzumab. And once they start getting um, um, significant um, benefit, um, in their disease, and when they start developing neuropathy, I will switch them to aromatase inhibitor along with trastuzumab and pertuzumab, very well tolerated, and they can have a very prolonged duration of response. Amelia study actually established TDM1 um, as a second uh, line therapy showing um, a, a small but a significant overall survival with a hazard ratio of 0 0.75 with TDM1 compared to capecitabine and lapatinib um, of about um, uh, four months. Uh, but this is being challenged uh, by two new uh, regimen. One would be the tucatinib along with trastuzumab and uh, capecitabine based upon the HER2 climb uh, study. Uh, and this compared it to um, uh, trastuzumab and capecitabine alone. This was a randomized phase three study, and this showed a significant improvement in the PFS um, of from 5.6 months um, um, uh, in the standard arm to 7.8 months in the uh, tocatinib arm um, with a, a hazard ratio of 0 0.54 and a significant um, uh, non-significant, but a trend towards significant uh, improvement in the overall survival with um, a hazard ratio of 0 0.66 with a p-value of 0 0.005. And in the patients who had brain metastasis, this is a first study, patients with active brain mets were included, and you can see a significant improvement in the uh, PFS from 5.4 to 7.6 months with a hazard ratio of 0 0.48. And you can see that both hormone receptor positive and hormone receptor negative uh, patients had benefit from the tucatinib-based uh, uh, treatment. Establishing, and this is now approved in um, uh, United States uh, for treatment. The second is the, uh, um, um, the ADC, which is the uh, antibody drug conjugate um, treatment with prestuzumab and deruxtecan, also called NHER2 uh, in United States a novel mechanism where you have a, a humanized anti-HER2 um, um, IgG monoclonal antibody with same sequence as crestuzumab and linked to a payload, uh, which is the topoisomerase uh, 1 inhibitor, uh, which is um, um, a very high uh, drug to antibody ratio of 8 is to 1. And there is a um, tetrapeptide-based uh, cleavable linker, which is attaching the two. I do not have time to go over the mechanism of action, but this was a phase two destiny trial where um, patients received um, the um, T TDXT uh, compared to um, any drug. And you can see in the very heavily um, um, pre-treated population with five previous lines of treatment, the um, response rate was, uh, overall response rate was 60%, have never seen that. And even in these uh, patients, you had a, um, a complete response of uh, 6% and a median duration of response of almost 14.8 uh, months at a data cutoff of 2019. And when they extended that to uh, data cutoff 2020, 
the median duration of response was almost 20 uh, months and median uh, progression free survival of 19.84 months. Um, now, overall, um, the main uh, problem with the, um, uh, the DXT XD is the toxicity of ILD, which was seen in about 16% of the patients. Um, and some fatalities were also um, noticed, and we are still trying to figure out if we can identify which population would uh, get the ILD. So what is my approach right now would be to start with taxane, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab in patients who are hormone receptor positive, or you can switch the taxane uh, very quickly to an aromatase inhibitor. Second line is TDM1. If they have no or uh, minor CNS disease, treated uh, CNS disease, you can start with trastuzumab, can though uh, there is nothing that I can say that you cannot do to catenib, but if patients definitely have CNS disease, uh, active brain meds and to catenib uh, with a hazard ratio of 0.48 for the PFS is a drug of choice. And then uh, trast uh, uh, trastuzumab, can can be used. More and more people are pushing both the uh, tricatinib and uh, tr uh, the trastuzumab direct can to the second line setting. And then the fifth line would be the usual uh, trastuzumab and chemotherapy, margituximab, which we did not have time to talk about, and nirat niratinib with capecitabine, which we also did not have time to talk about. Triple negative, I only want to present two um, 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 uh, data set points. One would be in passion 130. Uh, very important, this was a NAP paclitaxel with atezolizumab compared to a NAP uh, paclitaxel along, along with placebo. Um, significant improvement in uh, median progression free survival uh, from 5.5 uh, months to 7.2 months with a hazard ratio of 0 0.80 in PDL1 positive patients. Uh, uh, where the hazard ratio is 0 0.62. And based upon this, um, uh, it is Elizabeth in combination with uh, uh, NAT Paclitaxel got the accelerated approval uh, two years ago. However, when they presented the Impassion 131, which was the Atezolizumab in combination with Paclitaxel, there was no benefit in the progression free survival with a hazard ratio of 0 0.82. And just last week on August 20, 20, uh, 27, 2021, Roche um, withdrew its indication uh, for first line um, metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Um, since the, uh, the accelerated approval uh, was uh, based upon um, the PFS results uh, from the Impassion 130, um, for patients who had PDL1, which was more than 1%, but continued approval for this indication was contingent on the results of the Impassion 131 study, but uh, since, and the post-marketing requirement, since 131 did not meet its uh, primary endpoint, uh, this indication was recently withdrawn. However, based upon the Keynote 355, uh, design pembrolizumab is approved uh, in the first line metastatic uh, setting for a uh, triple negative breast cancer. Pembrolizumab can be given with any chemotherapy uh, arm, and this was uh, again gemcitabine and carboplatin or uh, paclitaxel or NAP paclitaxel. These were the three main chemotherapies uh, were done. Primary endpoint was PFS in PDL1 positive uh, patients, either CPS more than 10 or CPS more than one and intend to treat a um, uh, population. And you can see here that um, in patients, both with CPS more than one or more than 10, uh, there was a significant improvement in the PFS uh, compared uh, in the pembrolizumab arm compared to the patients in the placebo arm uh, with chemotherapy. And based upon this, uh, pembrolizumab is approved in combination with any chemotherapy in patients who are uh, PDL1 positive. 1% uh, or more. The last uh, slide that I have is on the sasituzumab, govitecan, which is another ADC, which is now approved in patients with metastatic triple negative with more than, uh, after two lines of uh, uh, chemotherapy. Um, this was based upon the ASCENT trial. Uh, the primary endpoint was PFS. 
And you can see here that there is a significant improvement in the PFS from 1.7 months uh, in the chemotherapy alone to 5.6 months with a hazard ratio of 0.4 months. In fact, based upon the interim analysis, the study was uh, stopped and um, uh, the, uh, uh, the trial was unblinded and uh, the drug was approved. And this is the overall survival, which is also significantly improved in, uh, from 6.7 months in the chemotherapy arm to 12.1 months with a hazard ratio of 0.48, it's statistically significant. And based upon this, um, uh, and these are the subgroup analysis that uh, this um, sasituzumab is beneficial in all patient population, whether less than 65 or more than 65. And based upon that, um, sasituzumab is now uh, the um, drug of choice uh, in patients who have failed two lines of chemotherapy. And the last study to present is the Olympiad study, which is again, the study of Olaparib in patients who have failed um, 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 uh, two or less lines of chemotherapy. And in hormone receptor positive patients have failed one line of chemotherapy. These are all patients who had germline uh, BRCA mutations and patients were randomized to, to two, uh, one fashion to olaparib versus chemotherapy primarily and point was PFS. And you can see that there was a significant improvement in the PFS from 4.2 months to 7.0 months with a hazard ratio of 0.58. And the same way on the Umbraca trial, Telazoparib, uh, which is another uh, PARP inhibitor, was also significant improvement in the progression-free survival from 5.6 months to 8.6 months in germline BRCA uh, mutation. So this is another uh, treatment which is available in patients who have germline BRCA mutations and triple negative breast cancers. Um, and that would be my last slide. So we have lots, we have made a lot of headway uh, and traveled uh, far in patients um, uh, in, in our treatments uh, for patients with uh, breast cancer, but there is a long road to go. Uh, uh, thank you all uh, for listening to me and giving me this chance uh, to present an update in uh, Breast Cancer 2021. With that, I will stop and take any questions. So feel free to put any questions you have either in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, our friends in Cameroon, you're welcome to walk up and ask any questions if you have any. And I am sorry, I took a little bit more time. All good. Give it another few seconds for questions. Oh, here we yeah, can, go. Can I ask some questions for, for people who have joined? I know I, I was kind of debating whether I should be uh, talking a lot about these newer medications, sasituzumab, immunotherapy, the PARP inhibitors. Are these easily available? Dr. Ranju, can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you now, yes. Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. That was a very nice presentation. We were very grateful. Um, so um, here in Bingo Baptist Hospital, unfortunately, our medical oncologist is not with us uh, right now. I'm sure she will have uh, some significant contributions or questions to ask uh, regarding the talk. Uh, we just want to thank you. Um, so we here in Bingo, I think we are trying to do right now, initially we're doing lots and lots of fine field aspirin um, uh, for, for, for diagnosis of, of breast cancer. But right now we are trying to do more uh, core needle biopsy so we can get uh, receptor testing, the PR, the PR receptor test, testing. Um, I am not so sure that we can actually test for the human epidemiology factor two receptors right now. Um, that would be something that I'm sure in the future we will be working towards uh, doing that kind of receptor testing. Um, well, the, the, the only thing I was going to say is I don't think again too that we can do home, uh, uh, ovarian suppression here. Uh, so for our patients who are pre-menopausal, pre I think we mostly do uh, tamoxifen rather than the AIs uh, in them. 
unfortunately, like I said, our medical oncologist is not here with us. So, because I understood you mentioned that if we have to do AIs for premenopausal patients, maybe that we'll have to do that in combination with uh, um, uh, ovarian suppression. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. And the, uh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, um, ovarian suppression is not uh, commonly done. Um, I find in um, countries outside of United States. Um, one of the other challenges, you know, um, financial, right? I mean, it's very difficult to have the patients come over and over again for coming every month for their ovarian suppression injections. So what I also do uh, is that patients who have uh, completed their um, uh, families and are not uh, planning to have uh, more children, um, oophorectomy um, actually uh, can be done. And I have a lot of my patients actually even in US here who will prefer to have um, their ovaries removed once they know that Dr. Gupta, I'm done with my you know, childbirth and I you know, would just rather have my ovaries removed. So instead of doing ovarian suppression like that, ovarian ablation can be done too. That is actually more commonly done um, in Europe. Um, uh, for that reason. But I think that there's a little bit of um, uh, less awareness how important it is uh, to do these in our young patients who have high amount of disease, especially lymph node positive disease. As I showed that the risk of recurrence is huge um, in after 10 to 15 years. And, and the other part, I feel like, you know, again, small steps uh, worldwide is just be switching from FNA to core biopsies at the time of diagnosis and reflexly doing ERP or HER2. In India also, they have to you know, request that to be done. And most of the times uh, they are already planning uh, surgeries because I think part of the problem is um, uh, that most of the patients who are diagnosed with um, breast cancers are still going to surgeons first. Um, and then the surgeons, you know, when they see that this is early stage, uh, they are not aware to some extent about the role of neoadjuvant treatment and they take them for surgery first. So I think we are missing in a small subset of population huge benefits from doing uh, a neoadjuvant treatment. Okay, thank you so much. I don't think we have any further questions from Cameroon. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Anju. Thank you so much for uh, spending the time with me and uh, taking the time to listen to me. I appreciate that. Well, thank you everyone um, for coming to our webinar today. I'll let you all go, but thank you again, Dr. Gupta, um, and feel free to join any other webinars that we have in the future. Thank you so much.